Hello, and welcome to the How to Make a Podcast podcast. My name is Casey Ruff from Boundless Body LLC, and I am the host of Boundless Body Radio. Before October of 2020, I was not a podcaster. Now, I have recorded hundreds of episodes featuring incredible guests, created tons of helpful content, and have consistently generated thousands of downloads every month since I began. I'm just a regular dude trying to share a message, and now I'm ready to show you my process, my successes and failures, and everything I've learned along the way to help you start your own podcast. Together, we'll explore the entire process of having a podcasting idea and take it all the way to publishing your first episode and explore all the steps in between. Then I'll give you all the tools that you will need so you can record as many episodes that you want to release after that. Podcasting is one of the most enriching skills I've ever added to my life. And I've learned a ton by talking with some of my heroes and sharing it with anyone who wants to join us on our journey. So sit back, grab a notebook, take some notes, and welcome to the How to Make a Podcast podcast. Hello, hello. This is Casey Ruff, and welcome to episode 16 of season two. Today, we are speaking with Nathan Marsala. Nathan is the owner and CEO of the Bison Group Incorporated. The Bison Group is a construction management and general contracting company aimed at working with discerning clients. Nathan is currently not a host of a podcast, but has con contemplated starting one. So for this special episode, we are going to be talking to Nathan and hopefully answering some of the questions that listeners who are also curious about starting their own podcast might have as well. Nathan Marsala, welcome to the How to Make a Podcast podcast. Thanks, Casey. Good to be here. Absolutely. This is so much fun. Um, we've talked about doing this for a very, very long time, and now we're finally hooked up and, and recording. Yeah. I mean, I think we've been talking about this for years. I mean, it was like the pre-COVID days we talked about, hey, this podcast thing. Pre-COVID? Like, pre what was that? I don't uh, remember. Yeah. It was, it was a long, long, <laughs> time, a long ago. time ago. <laughs> I haven't showered in two years. I know that. Um so, so like we mentioned in the intro, um, you, you and I have been talking about podcasts for a very long time. And something I really appreciate about you is we can talk about anything. You have a really good way of making things interesting that I might not normally care that much about. I'm not a contractor. I can say I don't care that much about contracting, but I can listen to you talk about your work endlessly. And I think it's absolutely fascinating. I think you're really, really good at that. And you've kind of toyed with the idea of, of doing podcasting in the past and different iterations. And now it seems like you're a little bit more serious about it since your business is just absolutely blowing up and <laughs> doing really, really well. So I thought this would be a really fun format just to chat back and forth about things you've been thinking of, things we've been able to do. And, and yeah, for the person who's also thinking about starting their own podcast, they might have exactly the same questions that, that you have or things that we'll discuss. Yeah, I know. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. And I'm excited to do this and to learn as I'm looking at your setup that we've got in front of us, it almost feels a little bit intimidating and it overwhelming. Does. Yeah, it um, does. I appreciate the compliment that you think I can talk endlessly and it's still fascinating about what we do in, in construction and building beautiful buildings and homes for, for our discerning clients. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think there's a lot of education in how we build, why we build, uh, why we use certain products or means and methods that we do hmm. that are not only valuable to our peers and helping elevate the conversation and the type of product that's delivered to consumers across the board, you know, rising boat lifts all tides. Uh, and I, I'm a firm believer in that. Um, there's some other fantastic uh, builders and business owners in our space, in the construction space that have, successful podcasts. And I think they've been very good at helping elevate the conversation of what a client should expect or how we should tackle the building process. And, you know, that's everything from the building science and how we build and why we do it that way. Is it the most cost effective? Depends on how you want to look at it, right? Mm -hmm. Like sometimes it might cost you a little bit more upfront, but you know, the lifetime cost of the building gets better maintenance gets better mm. callbacks headaches like you know there's there's things that may be a financial uh win and there's things that from a lifestyle perspective and time and energy and heartburn and heartbreak things like that it's a total no-brainer but sure we don't have that conversation enough yeah and i don't think our clients uh understand enough enough what we do so it's you know how do we how do we do that um we're starting this campaign with our social media platforms to try to show a little bit more behind the scenes of what we do. And there's a lot of guys out there doing it. I guess the fears and trepidations I have in, about the podcasting world is number one, 
do I have anything interesting to say? So there's a little bit of validation there with, with what you said, which is uh, helpful. Um, then then number two, like number, how do I get started? Where do I, what equipment do you use? Right. Audio quality to me seems very important as we've served podcasts or audiobooks and things like that in the past. The ones that don't have the audio dialed in are the ones that I kind of tune out to more quickly. It's not as comfortable to listen to. Yeah. Good point. Uh, you've done a good job with getting the audio dialed in and you know, the quality of the podcast that you've been putting out with boundless body and just making it fascinating. How do you find guests? You know, I don't want it to be just me sitting and rambling into a microphone uh, for an hour. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, a, a huge list of questions. Where do you get started? How do you know what you're going to say is going to be interesting? Um, obviously the market will tell you whether your product's being That's received right. well or not. And yeah, we're, our company's growing and it's exciting and we want to start delivering more content, more education, like I said, and you know, where that goes. Cool. Yeah, sky's, no, sky's the limit. That's great. So we almost never started a podcast because of that very first thing that you mentioned. What what in the hell am I going to say that hasn't been said 10 times better by a thousand other people who know this stuff a lot more than I do? And that was the surprising thing to me, especially with my imposter syndrome was like, you know, there is a certain way that I can say things or a question I can ask that can unlock something that maybe nobody else can. Plus my audience is going to be very different. And you know, that, that might just be our clients. That might be friends and family, but there is something unique to all of it. And so I think that concern is very valid, but I would say if you feel like you've got something inside you to share, there is an audience for you. I, I, and I think that's a really common one. I would ask one of my favorite questions to ask in the beginning when somebody's thinking about podcasting is what is your, why, what, what is the purpose at the end of the day that you would like to see come out of your podcast? That's you know, there, there's the off the cuff, you know, goofy answer, you know, make big bucks and never have to work a day in your life. But that's not reality. Number one, putting a podcast together, I'm under no illusion is not a lot of work. Number two, the monetization, like that would just be cherry on the top, icing on the cake. It's really about educating and sharing our knowledge with other builders, with you know, potential clients, with future clients, with people who we will never do a project for because mm. maybe we're not the right fit or we're not in their market, but they can better understand what's really taking place with the building of their structure of their place, right? We, mm. I mean, our, our company works in you know class A commercial office and high-end luxury residential. Everything we do is custom. But having people understand that, you know, it's anywhere from you know, 25 to 30 plus vendors, trade partners, subcontractors coming together on a project. You have multiple design teams between all of your engineers, your architects, your interior designers, your furniture vendors, et cetera. And they're all coming together at the table and you are sitting at the head and then you have hundreds and hundreds to thousands of different materials and parts. And it's all <laughs> got to go together. And then it's got to perform, right? And it's got to be comfortable. It's got to look nice. It has to fit within a certain cost constraint and time constraint to, to, to assemble the whole thing. And then it needs to last 50 to a hundred years. What's the big deal? Easy. Yeah. Like no big deal. Right. <laughs> um, you know, I, I heard somebody say it's, it's kind of like having, uh, all the parts dropped off for the, uh, for the BMW in your driveway. And it's like, okay, here you go. <laughs> yeah. You got to cover the seats. You got to put the foam on it. You got to put it all together. Not going to be driving anytime soon. Yeah. I mean, people aren't doing that, but that's, that's what builders are, right? We're, we're the conductor of the orchestra and we're, we're pulling it all together to play this beautiful symphony and create this experience. Now there's ways to go about that, right? We want to help not only our builder community and our trade partner community get better, but we want to help educate our clients and make sure everybody has a better experience and a better knowledge of just how it goes. You know, what all is involved. I think that's not something that gets talked about in our industry a lot. Cool. You know, it's a very siloed spot. We don't talk to our, contemporaries and our colleagues that we often see them as heavy competition and we don't want to share secrets. Um, but I don't think that helps elevate the game or help our clients in the long run. So I'm trying to think, you know, big picture. So yeah, that real why is I just want to share and educate everything that I've gained and learned. You know, I've been doing this for decades, you know, professionally I've been in the game for 20 years and, uh, started when I was 13, wearing a tool belt before that. So like, there's a lot in my head that 
Yeah. Hopefully it helps somebody else. Yeah. No, that's great. I think that's a really strong why. And I think it's really difficult when you're starting a podcast for most people. I think they think, okay, I'm going to start this podcast. At least all my friends and family are going to be listening to it. People are going to tune in. They're going to get a lot out of it. And the reality is far, far different than that. It takes a long time to build something up. So I always get concerned when somebody says they want to start a podcast, but they're only tracking things like downloads. And after five episodes, they've got, you know, 48 downloads and they're getting frustrated that not a lot of people are listening. We with, with, Boundless Body, our primary podcast, we ended up within the first few months getting up into like the top like five percent of podcasts, and then it grew a little more and got in top like four or three, you know, percentage of podcasts according to the numbers that I can see. But it that was because we were doing so much content, we were putting out so many episodes and just building it and building it. And I realized one of the strongest things that we have going for us now is I just never stopped. Like re- whether an episode did well or not, epi- you know, download wise so many people quit. And if you just keep going, you just find that so many more people will find your stuff over time. Is that, what do you think about that? Does that process, um, does that intimidate you? Does that, does that make you really excited? Does that, does that play to your personality in a way that, you know, you can be the one that's still producing content when other people have quit? Great question. Consistency, um, to sum it all up into one word, right? Just being consistent. It's true for anything and everything in life. Like, let's take it back to what you and I talk about constantly, right? We're trying to improve our physical, mental, psychological health through, you know, how we live our lives, what we're putting in our bodies, how much we're moving, lifting, stretching, all of that. The only way you get better and stay or get where you want to be is being consistent over time, right? Consistency over time equals results. So does inconsistency over time. You know, you can be consistently inconsistent yeah. and you can end up with the results you don't like. Mm. Um, so, I mean, that's all I hear you saying is be consistent. Yeah. You know, set a timeline, make a commitment that if you're going to do it, uh, you're going to commit to it for six months and X amount of episodes and you don't get a break until you hit that mark. And cool. then you, if you want to reevaluate, reevaluate whether it's you know, worth the, the ROI and that ROI does not have to be you know, financial. Like yeah. you just get pure satisfaction and bliss from talking into a microphone and that's right. You know, like if that's what it is and that's what it is. Um, but yeah, that consistency over time. Um, I think that's a big key. Cool. It's, it's something we have to ask ourselves on, on everything, right? Yep. Cause I'm looking at continuing to grow our business and you know, we've, we've got more people we're trying to onboard and hire that just changes the consistency level that we have to be at for what we're trying to attract client wise. Yep. yep totally. Right. Um, yeah, it's same with you guys and everything you're doing. So yep. I, I don't think it's, the secret sauce that you're sharing right here. It's not really a secret. It kind of applies to everything in life, right. but, you know, it, it, but you do have to ask yourself, like if that's the secret sauce, be consistent yeah. over time. Can you commit to the consistency? I just think of your Brazilian Jiu Jitsu practice as such a good example of this. Like it takes all of that repetition and going multiple times every single week you go, whether you like it or not, whether you're sore or fresh, you go on Wednesday at 2 PM to do your lesson because you have a lesson on Wednesday at 2 PM and you can get your ass kicked. I've heard you talk about some of these sessions that sound super hard, but but that doesn't improve overnight. That takes a a tremendous amount of work and it takes years and years and years to get up into the highest levels of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And it's only after putting in all that consistent work that you get there. So I think that's a good metaphor. Yeah, no, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If if you're not, if you're not showing up and putting in the work consistently, you're not going to get better. Gotcha. And you're going to, you're, you're going to regress, right? When I've had injuries and my ribs have been, you know, pretty jacked up, like, yeah, I slid backwards because I couldn't, be on the mat consistently like I yeah. wanted to be. Right? Gotcha. My body needed a heal. So what do you do? You focus on other areas. There are other parts of the game that you could focus on. Yep. You, know, you don't have to be rolling to always get better. Cool. And I had great you know, training partners that were willing to work with me on those things. But yeah, you're right. Um, the consistency is key. Cool. Yeah, that's great. It's good that you have that mentality going in. Next question I would have is what? What is the show? What does it look like? How long is it? What's the format? Are you doing interviews? It sounds like you'd rather do that than do solo podcasts. You've already talked about education as being a high priority, but what in your mind as you're thinking through this, what do you think your podcast is? Yeah, that's a a great question that I haven't fully vetted and answered. I'm still exploring that. I think there's a combination. I think there's times where it will be, Hey guys, this is, these are my thoughts on the day, right? There's not a lot. It might be a short format, but then other times it's going to 
involve a guest. I want to bring on, you know, different people in the industry, whether it's a, a specific vendor to talk about the product, if it's a trade partner to talk about, you know, how they approach their craft, whether it's another uh, builder and, you know, what they've seen, you know, I want to talk about wins and losses. I, don't, I think everybody focuses on the wins. Everybody in our social media landscape talks about shows the glorious, look how awesome this is. And we do it. I'm not going to exclude us, right? We, we want to put forth a nice portfolio. No one wants to highlight like, oh my gosh, this was a disaster because we totally didn't plan ahead properly and it ate our lunch. You know, who wants to market that? Nobody right. does, right? We don't learn from our wins. We learn from our losses. Mm. You know, my, my daughter, the conversation we have all the time is, um, and this is not my phrase, right? I stole this from Way of the Warrior Kid and Jocko Willink, who wrote that book. And it's one of my daughter's like favorite book <laughs> series. Um, and we talk about this when she goes to jujitsu tournaments and, and she's, you know, sparring and we do it in this regular life. Like you're winning or you're learning, mm. right? A loss is an opportunity to learn, right? I'm under no illusions that we make mistakes in our business. We all make mistakes every day. The question is, can you stop repeating the same mistake over and over again? Mm. Can you learn from it? So you think about the airline industry, right? When did aviation get better? When did planes dramatically improve? After crashes, probably. Exactly. <laughs> but what did we learn from them? We, we, they, lessons were shared and learned. Mm. Black boxes. Yeah. Right. They're installed in the aircrafts. They're gathering all the data, all the voice recordings. And then they're analyzing. And then they're sharing the information, right? Mm. They're acknowledging, hey, there was a mistake here. Whether it was in the engineering, the design, maybe there wasn't necessarily the mistake, right? I might be speaking a little bit out of my, my box on that a little bit. But at the end of the day, they learn from the mistakes. Mm. The airlines got better. The air, you know, the, the aircraft got better. The design got better. The materials that were used changed and improved. The what a pilot does in different situations changed and improved. Interesting, right? Because they learn from others' mistakes. Like why we don't do that um, enough in our business is something I'm I'm actively trying to to find. Like because there is that fear. Does it come back and bite me in the butt? Because right. Everyone's going, oh, well, you're the guy that screwed up this, 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 and this. And like, you know, these guys are just flawless at everything they put out on Instagram. Right. Mm. Are they? Like, yeah. Well, okay. So that kind of blew my mind. We did not talk about what we were going to talk about for this episode. This, there was no script. We were flying completely off the cuff. When you said talking about things we've learned, that a little bit blew my mind. That sounds like a fantastic podcast that I'm probably not going to find. That sounds very interesting. Maybe it's not something you do like every single week, if that's how frequently you want to do it, which was another one of my questions, but like to have an episode here or there where you're saying like, look, this, this is what happened. We thought this outcome was going to happen, but this outcome came out of it. Here's three lessons that we really learned from this that I would love to share with you. And this is something we're going to do moving forward. Uh, that sounds compelling. That sounds interesting. It sounds honest. And it sounds like something in the industry could really benefit from that. That's fascinating. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I think it's an industry. I think it's something that a lot of industries could benefit from, not just ours, but sure. yeah. Um, well, maybe that's what we call it. Things we learned. Interesting. Maybe that's, that's the name that's, of the podcast, right? That's there. a great now, now, name. Now I got to figure out how to lock it up before this episode drops. That's a that's a great name. This is this episode's over. Go to the computer. Go go look it up. No, I think that's I, that's fascinating. And, and again, how often you include that? I I think that's very authentic. And I I for one, I'm sure you do too. Really appreciate authenticity when somebody's talking. I, I want to hear, you know, your struggles, things you've had to overcome, not just all the successes all the time. So that's a really great point. I love that. Um, frequency. Do you think once a week would be about right? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, right now, um, making time, carving out okay. time is a, is a tough, tough thing just with what we have on our, on our plate. So I think timing of when we launch is going to be a big deal, mm -hmm. right? Like, is the iron, I mean, I just kind of think about when's the best time to plant a tree 20 years ago. Yeah. What's the second best, second time? best time now. <laughs> All right. Exactly. <laughs> right. Um, if I want the shade from that structure and that tree, I, I got to start it now. Yeah. And I think if I keep delaying and pushing and pushing and pushing, I'll find an excuse to delay it. So yeah. I got to eliminate those and just got to say, yeah, we're going to do it. So mm. the consi this comes back to consistency. Um, I would ideally like to say, Hey, once a week, 
right? If you keep, just like anything, if you're consistent when certain things come out and it's predictable, yeah. people like predictability, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's the whole thing that's going on with our markets right now. People yeah. don't have the predictability yeah. because there's a lot of mixed messages and then well, yeah. here we are. A show that you and I both really love and who he's also been on this podcast, both of our podcasts, Scott Mazinski. Um, he does carnivore cast podcast, which we both love. They, he releases every Tuesday, like clockwork. Yeah. There was no episode this week. I almost lost it. I don't know what to do with myself. This is a, a first world disaster in my world. And I want to like text him to be like, yo, what's going on? Like, are you live still? What's up? Like the, when, when you're doing that with consistency, if you miss a week, that becomes really tough. And so the time question is it important to think about. And I would say as of now, most of my podcasting stuff, it's about a one-to-one -one ratio of the time I spend in an interview with the time I spend with the podcast. That said, I've done over 300 of these at this point. And so starting You're out 300 now between boundless body has almost nearly almost 300. And we've done, you know, 16 of these plus season one was 10 solo episodes that took people through the process. And so, yeah, I've hit record over 300 times. And, and so I've gone through that refining process, but I would say in the beginning, the time factor is probably like three to one. You'll probably spend three times more editing, worrying, obsessing, finding every single um you say, which is a bazillion times when you <laughs> have your own voice played back. It's, it's, it's really tough, but that initial learning is what takes a ton of time, which is probably important to consider when you're very, very busy. And that might be yeah. enough to say like, wow, weekly, I would love to do weekly, but maybe that's something I transition. Yeah, maybe into. it's every other week at the beginning. So, I mean, here's a question. What are your thoughts on trying to be truly authentic? And I mean, obviously everything has some editing that might need, you know, intro, outro, et cetera, but not editing anything in the middle, like just get the volume set up at the get go, get the recording done and you go, you go straight out and you just publish it because, you know, it's their warts and all, right. We're talking about things we learned, yep. mistakes and failures. Yep. Like, is that a mistake in the podcasting world to not, edit? like there are people that I've listened to for a gazillion episodes in the past. Um, and initially their audio quality wasn't there, but the quality of the information and the content yeah. was, and I could overlook that in a lot of ways for a while. And there were parts that annoyed me like, dude, your dog is barking in the background. Every episode. <laughs> Can you please do something about that? Like it's annoying. Or I know you've got something better than your AirPods to, to do this with. Right. 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 Like there's Yeah. That's a challenge. Those are yeah. great questions. Those are great questions. On this show, one of my favorite questions to ask a podcast host is, what did you think was really important in the beginning that you no longer think is important? And I would say by far, the most consistent answer I've heard is editing. If you have, uh, I will say in my experience and the podcasters I've talked to, if you have good content, the content is king. That will forgive a lot of sins in audio quality. Um, you know, We've already mentioned Scott Maslinski. He purposely does a, an extremely minimalist Mm -hmm. podcast. He, yeah. he purposely chose to get the cheapest mic. He records in his kitchen. He sends his file off to somebody in France for like 10 or 15 bucks, does all the like processing of the, of the edit audio for him, but he does not do a single edit himself. And his show's great. His show is fantastic. He does have good content. He's got, you know, great people on. He asks really good questions and you don't, you don't, you don't even notice, like you don't notice yeah. whether it's professional grade audio or not. Sorry, so, Scott, I haven't listened to you for a while. I probably should. <laughs> he didn't put an episode out this week. What the hell? Um, but, but yeah, that's a really good question. I think, I think more often than not, you can get away with not editing and a lot of people move away from it the more they do. So yeah, I don't, I don't think I wouldn't, I wouldn't not put something out if it wasn't edited. That said, like Monday, we're interviewing Dr. Angela Stanton. We're talking about migraines. My dogs lose their minds. Sounds like he's mauling the UPS driver out in the front of my house. Like that would have been terribly distracting. It was terribly distracting. Even Angela was like, whoa, was everything good over there? Like in the middle of the interview. And it's like, yeah, yeah, we're good. Like stupid dogs, whatever. And, and so like that, that, if I would have kept that in, that would have been really detrimental to the content, which was really good. So there's, there's, I think a fine line there. Okay. Yeah. No, that's fair. Yeah. Um, we talk a little bit about equipment and one of the things that I chose to do early on was invest in some of the stuff that you see before you, which you did say looked intimidating. So we're looking at the road, uh, the, the, the road, roadcaster pro, uh, road is the brand R O D E. And this is a podcast mixer that is made for podcasts. 
this does everything I need. So when I play the intro music, it's a little button on the side. The intro music starts to play. I don't need to cut that in later on. There's also like funny like sounds and stuff like that. Boundless Body, it's the same thing. So our intro music- You haven't been in front of a live audience this whole time. Have not been in front of a live audience besides our dogs. (laughs) But what I'll do is I'll play the music. When it gets to a certain point, I'll fade it down. I'll say, hello, this is another episode of Boundless Body Radio. And I'll let the music play in the background, but all of that is live. And this tool has allowed me to be able to do that. This was like 600 bucks. So this was not cheap. It's not bad. But it's, yeah, it's, I mean, what do in, you want to put out? Right? Intimidation factor. This this got me over intimidation factor. Before this, I got a different mixer, looked really nice, tons of dials and switches and knobs and all kinds of shit. And like reading through the user manual, I couldn't figure it out at all. And if I'd kept that, we would not have a podcast. So this tool for me was essential because everything was so easy. I can control the levels up and down. I can mute you. Um, I can, you know, have a line in from the phone, which is where we do most of our interviews is all through Zoom. So I just dial up Zoom on my phone. I can record video, which we put on YouTube. Um, this, This tool for me made all the difference because everything is here. It's not always perfect because if I have that, you know, the intro outro music playing in the background, I can't edit that later. So if I goof up somebody's name in the intro, which I do pretty much every episode or you know, some of those things, I can't go back and change, but, but this has made podcasting possible for us. Okay. So cool. this, this being self-contained has been really helpful, records directly into a micro SD card, which I then take the card, plug it into my laptop. And then from there, I do all the processing and everything else. Um, the only other thing I would say on hardware that has been really great has been the microphones. So these microphones are also Rode brand, R-O-D-E. They're pod mics. They're made specifically for podcasting. And you can see, since you're sitting right here, if I click on your microphone and click on the microphone itself, road pod mic is the first one to pop up. So it's not any other brand. It's not a condenser dynamic, whatever. I don't need to mess with any of that. I know exactly the microphone and all the presets are there and ready to go. It's already optimized for the connection between this mixer and this microphone. Okay. Everything else was Amazon. The the, the headphones you're wearing for this setup, 15 bucks on Amazon. This, this boom mic, which is amazing was Amazon. It was like 30, 40 bucks. Um, the mic stand that you have was pilfered from my dad. Who's in the TV industry. I just stole it. (laughs) Same with the cables. Uh, this is from my dad's station. Don't tell them. Um, but all that other stuff I could cut corners on because I'd invested more in those parts of equipment. That makes sense. Do you think you'll be doing in-person interviews when you do interview somebody or will they be more remote? You know, I think it's a combination. Cool. Um, you know, the people that I would eventually like to talk to, I want the biggest, broadest audience I can get as far as guests that can share their, you know, what I learned and here's how we can be better. Yeah. Like, I, I think that just goes all over the map and I would love to be able to, I mean, technology has allowed us to be able to go beyond just our small market and, you know, the Salt Lake area that we we currently live in and operate out of. But that being said, like, there's definitely going to be people locally that I'd want to have on or maybe, yeah, I've got, you know, colleagues and friends, um, people we've made contact with that uh, we've got to know really well that I think have a lot of great things to change, you know, just to, to say, to share. See, there's an edit right there. <laughs> and as they travel in town, I'd love to snag them for an hour and like, let's have a conversation. Cool. Let me buy you lunch. Let's have this conversation and cool. let's, you know, put this out there and see if it helps both of us. I love um, that. I love that. No, that's great. I'm purposely not going to edit that out. So you can listen to it when you're listening to this episode, when it drops tomorrow to see if it's distracting or not, you can decide. Um, and so, okay. So that leads me to another really good question. We talked to a lot of different podcast hosts about this. And in particular, we talked to Daniel Hamilton, um, last episode, episode 15. Are you getting your formula one mixed up? Oh, Do you man. mean Danny Rick? Maybe. Maybe Uh, for the listener, Nathan Marsal has got me completely hooked on formula one after the Netflix series, dude, I text you probably three times a week on what, what's this specific rule? What kind of tires are they using? What's going on? I finally invested in the app so I can watch all the races. Like so stoked. So yes, we're sitting in front of this amazingly beautiful formula one book. I've got this incredible collection of pictures and smells like the rubber from the tires. Like, Oh yeah. It's a fun book. (laughs) We can always just talk about formula one for the rest of the hour. It is. 
that and jujitsu I geek out on, you know, sports wise. I don't know why, like football, basketball, I grew up playing baseball and golf and those like, they've all kind of faded into the background. (laughs) I don't know why. Like there's just something about these other sports, but that's. You were ahead of the curve as far as Formula One goes. I had to watch the Netflix series like everybody else in America. You were already ahead of that. So kudos to you. Um, but, but again, on that note, so, so talking to, to Danny Hamilton, she has the podcast, unlock the sugar shackles. Her podcast is about getting over sugar addiction and blood sugar issues. That's all she covers. And so if you think about health and fitness in general, that's a very, very specific area. That's very narrow, yeah. And and she keeps it narrow on purpose, and she doesn't drift outside of that. When we started Boundless Body Radio, we wanted to talk to anybody. And I would tell people, some of the guests, like, look, this is about health and fitness, but everything's about health and fitness. Like, I, we can ask you questions that will make it sound like that. We just want really good stories, and we want good content. We'll tie it into health and fitness somewhere. And I do think there's pros and cons to each one. So we've had on boundless body conversations about all kinds of different things with all kinds of different people, which is cool because it's very general about health. But if I'm doing, you know, two or three episodes that are about carnivore, and then I do an episode about, you know, uh, the structure of the foot that may not be that same target audience. I was hoping that I could build the whole thing by doing a lot of separate things, but it it could be that Boundless Body Radio is very, very general and, and could be benefited from being more specific. So have you thought a little bit about how dialed in you want to be as far as specifics, like who your audience is, what kind of message are you sharing or who you're interviewing? Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately there's two audiences. Other industry professionals that we want to help learn and grow from our mistakes and from our successes. And then I I would view anybody as a potential client, Mm. right? Whether they fit our demographic or what our ideal client is or or is not. I would say anyone that is a future client, anyone that is going to build out a corporate office space or a, you know, high end renovation of an existing home or a new build. What do they need to know? Yeah. You know, why should they care? I mean, you think about, yeah, what's a, the biggest financial investment people make is typically their homes. Companies, it's a huge investment. Like we're looking at office space right now for our, our company and it's expensive. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, rent is expensive right now. And then you put in a build out on top of that. You know, these are big investments. And to not, I don't think customers and clients need to understand the entire process and they don't need to know the nuts and bolts. That's why they're hiring us. But to better understand a couple of the nuances, I think it helps the conversation. Yeah. You know, well, why wouldn't we do this? Mm. Like why, you know, here's an example. Like why do you want to use product X over product Y? Because product X costs more. Like, why should I use that as a client? Why should I accept that from a builder? Is he just trying to upcharge me because he's getting fee on top of that? Would a builder do that? I'm sure there are some that are out there. Most of the ones that we know wouldn't do that. Mm. But why would we? Well, because it's a better product. It's going to last better, performs better. Yeah. You know, the life cycle of your building is better. Your maintenance is better. I don't want you calling me three years down the road. Unless you're calling me to say, hey, let's go do another job. Yeah, right. Like we got another project right. we want to go do. Like right. that's what I want. Mm. I, I don't want to send my team back out to go fix something. Right. Right. So you want repeat business for somebody that's very happy or they referred five of their friends. Yeah. Whatever. I mean, here's a quick example. You know, there's, you can buy the pocket doors uh, frames at Home Depot. They're cheap and no knock on that manufacturer, but they do not perform well. Just lost another sponsor. Unbelievable. I know. I, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Between all of the uh, the vegetable and manu- food manufacturers, uh, we've lost, lost them all. We've got nothing now, left now. Now that the sponsor is going to go unnamed, right? Um, <laughs> this is sponsored by the Bison Group Incorporated. <laughs> but, you owe me. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's. If a client wants a pocket door, and there are times and places, it's a great fit and it's a great look. They've been a nightmare for decades, right? But there's a fantastic product out there. It's it's mandatory. And we tell every design team we work with, we tell every client up front, like we work with cavity slider for our pocket door systems. It's not negotiable. And here's why. And when we educate them, oh, wow. Yes, absolutely. Is it a lot more for that frame and, and components? Yeah. Does it truly perform that much better? Absolutely. Number one, 
you can ask anybody that's had a pocket door growing up in a house or in a house right now. Most people hate them. They're just weird. They don't work that the, well. Exactly. Right. The little plastic latch that you have to like fumble your finger through and like try to constantly sliding, up, banging, yeah, yeah. right. The hall. Yeah. It's, it's a problem, mm. but there is a product that is phenomenal. They've solved that, right? They use technology. They use engineering. They use better materials. Well, all of that costs money. Yep. But you know what? I don't have clients that are disappointed. Yeah. Callbacks. They're like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Like, I didn't know I could do soft, close, soft, open on a pocket door that glides as well as it does and performs like that. And it's like, I know. Yeah. Now, you know, part of that is, do you have the right trade partners and craftsmen to put it in place too? Yeah. But I'm not worried about that door failing. I'm not worried about a callback because, you know, the, the cheap pine wrapped in the, in the metal is deforming over time. Like, yeah. it's just... It's not an issue. So this is where I think your idea is really unique and very viable. I think you've really thought this through. And the thing that I'm thinking of is we're sitting here, we're talking about pocket doors. Nathan, how much have I ever talked about pocket doors in my life? Would you assume? Do you think this is something that comes up like once a week, once a month? I think it might be something you talk to. Your sweet Bethany. <laughs> a lot like, of pillow talk. Daily night. <laughs> yeah, like, pocket, pocket door. Oh my God, <laughs> what am I going to do with that? No, I, it's probably something you only ever think of. When you're in front of one going, gosh, this thing sucks. This thing sucks. So on that note, you've been more consistent with your social media posting lately, and you have made a post about this that I would argue is either not targeted at me. I'm not a consumer. I'm not into buying pocket doors in the next three weeks, I don't think. Um, but I still watched that video, and I, w I was like very interested in it. Like It was legitimately like really cool to watch. I learned more about pocket doors than I've learned in my previous 38 years. And you could see that product shine through. So your idea of I'm going to be talking, you know, maybe directly to contractors, I'm going to be interviewing subcontractors, maybe they're going to be the bulk of who listens to this. But as somebody who's not a contractor, I still find that really interesting. And I think you can hook a lot of people who are consumers and at least start to build this idea of, oh yeah, like, I remember they talked about, you know, certain bay windows and pocket doors and, and stair moldings or whatever. Bay I need to call died. this guy. Bay windows died a long time ago. Oh, they did? Yeah. Oh. They're not really a thing anymore. I'm learning about bay windows too now. Yeah. <laughs> not a thing. Not not really a thing anymore. Damn, I thought that was like the best place to like set up pillows and read or something. Like back in the 90s. <laughs> 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 well, we had one in my 1996 J&J home. So See? there you go. <laughs> Cranberry Hill gets a shout out. Um, yeah, so I, I do think that is interesting. I think... Oftentimes people almost like talk down to their audience and don't think that they're interested in some of those more, um, you know, more advanced, I guess I would say kind mm -hmm. of topics. It's almost like, you know, you and I both love the Peter Atia podcast. It's, I listen to it every week. There are yeah. episodes that I understand maybe 3% of what the hell they're even talking about, but I appreciate that they're not trying to dumb it down for me. They're, they're talking about what's really important. And so I, again, I think that idea is really viable. No, no, I appreciate that. That's, that's good to hear. And you know, how narrow, how broad it goes. Uh, great question. I mean, I'm really kind of stuck on the, what we learned mm. and kind of just diving <laughs> that's deep. That's a good idea. Down. Um, I think that's a good idea. See, there it is. Um, yeah, I know. I, I know. I know. You'll listen to this. Uh, the worst part is listening to my voice after this and then hearing like, oh, I, 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 I have a, I have a post-it note on my podcasting spot that says, um, to remind me not to say, um, a million times. And I still do it. I don't think anybody likes the sound of their voice. When it's back <laughs> no, to them. absolutely not. That's the worst part. I'm still trying to get over that with <laughs> talking on social media period about things. It yep. just feels awkward. It's never been who I am, but I love sharing and teaching. Yeah. And the best way for me to do that is to find the mediums that work yep. and that I can disseminate information yep. and just do the reps. You have to practice to get good at it, to not feel awkward about it. And you do a very good job of that. I would say, um, I did have another question about formatting. Were you, were you thinking about doing continuous episodes? So maybe like you're going to release, you know, once a week, once every other week, or would you also consider doing shows that have episodes? So maybe you put together something and it's, you know, once a quarter, once a year, you release 10 episodes, 20 episodes. That's kind of your focus for a season. And then since you're so busy, you don't have to focus on it all the time. You can leave those, you know, 10, 20, whatever episodes out there that people can still use and download download and learn from, and then just call it season two and season three and season four. Have you considered that? 
I haven't considered that. And I don't think that's it. I, I like the idea of batching a bunch of stuff and then delaying the release, helping with that time management. Yeah. But I think so many things change so frequently in today's world, not just, you know, what we deal with on a day to day, but what happens in our own industry, right? Yeah. It's no secret in the last two years, supply chain issues, right? cost of materials, right. labor, yep. availability. Yep. It's, it changes almost on a weekly basis. Weekly, I yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's insane on how fast something can go from, yeah, we got this. You can have it in 14 weeks. And then, you know, six days later, it's up to 25 yeah. weeks. Same product, yeah. nothing changed. So being continually releasing episodes would be more consistent and would be able to respond more, to the yeah, industry. Yeah, more on time. I mean, there's definitely historical things, you know, talking about like our history with pocket doors that we just right. you know, <laughs> right. t- t- talked about. Like, th- there's things like that. Or, you know, there's details that I've built in the past that are really, really cool. I will never, ever in my career ever do it again. Mm. Right? Number one, it was a headache. Number two, looking back, knowing what I know now, man, there was a lot of exposure and risk to yeah. do it the way we did it. Did it work? Yeah. Does it still work? Yeah. Does it still look cool? Yeah. But that may have been the exception. But it could have been the exception. I want to think that we really spent a lot of time with everybody around the table from, you know, our trade partners that were involved to the architect and, and us as the builder, really diving in and trying to think, okay, then what? Mm. And what happens after that? Like yeah. the redundancies and really trying to bulletproof it. But when you really think back about, wow, was that really the, the wisest course of action? Interesting. No, like, and so at what point do you tell somebody that's a fantastic idea, but we're not the people to build that. Gotcha. And, and, yeah. and like to have those conversations, like some of those older things that they're, they're always going to be relevant, but yeah, if you're talking about, Hey man, we tried to go do X, Y, and Z. And you know, we had a conversation in Nashville last week at this contractor coalition summit. that was fantastic. Um, and I literally sat there and I, I, I asked a question at the table to uh, Brad Levitt from AFT. And, you know, Brad's got a phenomenal podcast. He's got an incredibly successful company. They do a lot of amazing work. He did a great job at the summit. And I asked him, I said, dude, I've got this problem. And I don't know what to do. Like it literally came up while I was at this summit. Do I delay the order of the material? Because we have nowhere to set it. We have nowhere to store it. It's the constraints of the site just do not allow us to have this come too soon. Mm. It's got to come when we need it. Yeah. No sooner or later. Our vendor is out of warehouse space. They have nowhere to store it themselves. <sighs> Currently the lead time's fine. In fact, it gets here too quickly, but mm. we want to pull the trigger. That's kind of been our, our thing. We got nowhere to put it. The hard part is it's so big and heavy. I can't even go like have it shipped to my house or a storage unit. I was going to say, it's not sitting in your backyard. <laughs> no. <laughs> Because it needs a forklift to get off the truck. Wow. Like it's, it needs equipment to move it. And we don't want to be double handling it. We don't want to be, you know, having equipment deliver to offload something in location A and then do it again, you know, six weeks later in location B. So do you figure out that logistic or do you constantly watch that lead time with the supplier and your vendor? And then you pull the trigger when the timing is optimal and you hope because that's all we have, it feels like right now, is hope yeah. that the logistics and supply chain and truckers are available. Mm. Because we've literally had it where product was ready and we, we waited three months for the product and then it waited another three weeks because there was no one to drive it out. There was no truck. Wow. It was stuck in the Midwest. Yeah. Like, do we, do we roll the dice? You know, is this something we need for final inspection? Years ago, yeah. Right now, we've got some luck on our side and some understanding with you know, municipalities and the, the inspectors. Um, but then it comes down to, okay, we have to have a conversation with the client. Like this is our plan of attack right. and our strategy. And so I, I literally asked Brad that and, you know, we, we talked about strategies and, you know, I said, this is what I think I have to do. And he goes, uh, yeah, I would agree. I think mm. that's the only option. And that was a conversation that had you pushed, you know, record and had microphones could probably be something that would be relevant and shareable to people in your industry that they would probably appreciate. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, well, time will tell whether we made the right decision or not. Right. But then it comes down to educating the client, having a conversation right. with the client, like, right. Hey, um, this is what we're up against. So this is the decision we're going to make. Yep. We've vetted it and we're going to roll the dice, yep. but then they're not caught off guard in 18 weeks. Right. 
right? When that makes sense. something may or may not be here, like it was supposed to be. All of that is relevant, but those are real time conversations that we can have with people and that cool. it can be these lessons learned. But at the same time, right? If there wasn't this sense of community that, um, you know, Morgan and Nick and Brad with Contract Coalition Summit have been trying to build this community of builders actually opening and talking up with each other. I, it would have been a lonely spot to try to figure that right, one out, right? Right. Like you the network of people to reach out to yeah. for, for answers and resources yeah. is smaller. And I think a podcast that can talk about these things can help open that door a little bit more yeah. or at least provide, you know, some insight. Yeah. Um, I love that. You mentioned Brad's podcast. What things does he do really well that you would love to emulate? And what things would you do a little bit differently? Better or worse? Doesn't have to be like you're trying to one up him or anything. It's just what do you, what would you do different? Uh, that's a great question. I, you know, I don't know if I could one up Brad or Nick Schaefer at NS Builders and the Modern Craftsman podcast. Like these, you know, um, they've been at it a long time. Yeah. And as far as emulate, natural. Cool. Be real. Be be natural. They're both very natural in that environment. Um, they always have something interesting to talk about. That comes back to that whole fear, right? Like, well, I always have something interesting to talk about. Like yeah. what happens when your brain just goes crickets. <laughs> like, <nothing's there. laughs> uh, Find another guest. <laughs> <laughs> what, what am I going to talk about? Like it's due on Tuesday, you know, Yep. Scott, where are you? <laughs> exactly. It's Wednesday. <laughs> no. um, but yeah, there's that whole, you know, as far as what, what I do differently, I don't, I don't know. You know, cause I, I think one thing I, I know how Brad records his podcast. He, he shared that with us and I thought it was genius. I'm not there yet, but it's great for time management. Right. Um, and it helps in, in a lot of ways, but you know, he's very honest. There's still hours to put in. Yeah. There's still the work, right? right. You know, you still got to get a hold of people to put on yeah. the, on the show and coordinate yeah. schedules. All of that being you know, said, they're just, they're, they're natural. They always have something interesting to say. So that's what I'd want to emulate. Cool. Right. Just a breadth of knowledge, very authentic, very natural. It doesn't feel forced when you're listening to the conversation. Nice. That's yeah, that's great. I love that. I love that. You can tell when people are forcing things or they're, you know, brown nosing a little bit with their guests or, you know, that the guest is maybe talking about their products a little bit too much and that's not the purpose of the podcast. And so I think that's really fair. I, I, I like hearing things that are, you know, more natural and flow better. And I, I think in that sense, you could do, um, a podcast really simply without doing a lot of edits and putting a ton of time and that type of resource that you just frankly don't have a lot of into. Um, so we've been talking for about 45 minutes, just over, um, after having this chat, do you feel more likely or less likely that you will start a podcast? And I'm just going to preface that by saying like, we encourage people to quit, quit early. This isn't for everybody. The, the example we use all the time is you and Shauna on Tuesday afternoon, always get together and have Rose at three and talk about your crazy cats. Totally fine with that. But if you're doing that and you're wanting to monetize and get tons of downloads, like, man, that's going to be pretty tough. I don't think a lot of people are going to care about your crazy cats when you're you know, getting buzzed on Rosé. That said... But I thought all the cat videos did really well. <laughs> they, they do. And if that's your thing, I love it. You're going to okay. find all the people online who love cat videos. You just might not get monetized unless it's by friskers. I don't know. Um, but again, the question is like, yes, we encourage people to do it. You do have a voice. You should do it if you feel strongly about it. If you do it for the wrong reasons, we encourage people to quit. After having this conversation, do you feel more confident or less confident that you will start a podcast? I'm more confident that I would start a podcast. Cool. I love it. You're going to do great. I, for one, like, I'm glad you said that. And I'm really like crossing my fingers. It will be a podcast I listen to. Well, that's encouraging. And I hope I don't let you down with <laughs> number one, not getting it off the ground, but number two, that it is captivating enough that it's interesting enough. And that, um, yeah, I think a podcast or an, a, a, whether it's a book, a podcast video, whatever the medium is, if it's not captivating, it's not interesting. Yep. Right. Like yep. if, if people, if you, if you make it interesting enough in some way, shape or form that they want to learn, like there's a gentleman, um, and the way he talks about building science, so captivating. Like I could, I could spend all day like in a lecture hall 
<laughs> listening to him talk about building science. And cause he, he, he makes it fun and engaging. Um, that's something I definitely want to emulate and, and imitate, um, is how he's brought this, you know, captivating sense of humor to taking real difficult subject matter to digest, you know, cause it's, it's just math and physics. He's like, it's just simple. It's just math and physics. Yes. Cause physics is so simple. Um, <laughs> I don't think I aced that class in high school, <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, that's, but he does, he has a great way of making it simple yeah, and digestible. Um, I liked reading Richard Feynman's work and, uh, because he, he was a physicist, but he yep. made it fun and accessible yep. and, and it was always an interesting read, right? Yep. Like it really engaged me in wanting to know more about physics. Uh, you know, Mark does the same thing with building science. Cool. So yeah, how I, how I do that, that'd be, I guess that's the question that I'm going to have to figure out yeah. on the fly and people, if they want to tune in, we will find out if I can get that name. That's great. Uh, what I learned. That's great. We'll have to do a follow up. Is that what we called it? What I learned. Yeah. I mean, yeah. If it's, if it's available, I think that's what a we great learned. name. What we, what we learned. That's great. What we learned. Um, We'll see if it's available. If, if, if it is great, that's what we're going to call it. I love what it. we learned. I love it. Well, I think you have the most important things thought through how you edit, um, you know, getting your hosting sorted out, um, exactly what mixer you use or what laptop, all that other stuff. Those are minor details. And once you figure them out, you'll have them figured out. It's, it's definitely like, um, yet mentality kind of stuff of like, yeah, I don't know how to do this yet, but I'll figure it out. Once you do, you'll have it on lockdown. You'll definitely get to the point where you're spending less and less time editing and yeah. worrying about it, more time having everything automated. But the important things, considering your audience, considering your message, what are your strengths? What are you going to play to? Who are you? Who are you not? Who are you not trying to be? Um, I think is really critical. And it really sounds like you've been really thoughtful about all that stuff. So I think so. Kudos to you. And I'm really looking forward to this, this show getting off the ground. Um, until then, for people listening, where can people go to find you and connect with you and your work? Uh, probably the best place to go is Instagram. Bison Group UT is in Utah. Bison Group UT. Um, that's where pretty much most things. From there, you can get to our our website. Um, ND Marsala on Instagram is my personal. Cool. Um, I, I post some more of my personal things there. More of the company and the business stuff is on Bison Group UT. Yeah. But yeah, that's cool. where we pretty much hang out. That's great. We'll link that in the notes. And I can say to the listener, even if you're not interested in pocket doors, I'm telling you, it's really good content. You've done a really great job with it. You make it interesting and engaging. And I subscribe to both. And I think they're great. I love hearing what your family's doing and also learning about pocket doors. So honestly, like, thank you for making something that could be way over my head and something I don't really care about to be something that I care about. And I really appreciate learning. You're really good at that. So I'm um, looking forward to see how this goes in your journey. All right. Thanks, Casey. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to the How to Make a Podcast podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please leave us a rating and review on Apple. Also, be sure to check out the show that made all of this possible, Boundless Body Radio, where we provide tons of helpful and informative content, feature incredible guests, and talk all about health and wellness. Cheers. And thank you for joining us on the How to Make a Podcast podcast.